Now, from WYDC-TV, this is Big Fox News at 10. We begin tonight in Elmira. We sit down in a one-on-one -on -one interview with the Chemung County Sheriff addressing his concerns about an increase in gun violence. Big Fox's Matt Kleindens tells us why the sheriff thinks this problem may only get worse. Good evening, and the Chemung County Sheriff's Office has been fielding more calls on gun-related incidents throughout the county during the pandemic. And the sheriff is warning about a possible uptick in violence with the rollback of COVID restrictions. So it would kind of go against, uh, you know, logical thinking that uh, things would slow down a bit. It's a trend that surprised the Chemung County Sheriff's Office. Over the past year, Bill Schramm says his officers have been responding to more gun-related incidents throughout the county. I know certainly within the city of Elmira, uh, they've had an increase in homicides and other gun-related violence um, during this pandemic time. The trend is not just isolated to Elmira or Chemung County. According to the Gun Violence Archive, nearly 20,000 Americans died from gun-related violence more than any other year in at least two decades. When you have <clears throat> individuals in society that feel that the manner in which they should settle their differences is by uh, resorting to guns and shooting at each other, um, you know, unfortunately there's consequences to that. You know, innocent people are getting shot at or hit that have nothing to do whatsoever with uh, the issue at hand. As the outlook on the pandemic improves and the seasons change, Schramm is concerned with another uptick in violence. People have been bottled up for about a year now. Um, restrictions are starting to loosen up. We're starting to get better weather. Spring and summer are right here uh, around the corner. Um, that in itself always tends to drive the increase in violence. You're going to have a lot more people out, a lot more people that are going to be anxious to get back to the old ways, and I think that's going to that's gonna be a recipe for um, bad interactions. He says the sheriff's office is preparing accordingly to address the crimes. Matt Kleindens, Big Fox, WYDC in Corning. The suspect in Monday's mass shooting at a Colorado grocery store has his first court appearance today as a community mourns the lives lost and waits for answers. Camila Bernal has more from Boulder. She's giggly and bubbly and just didn't, you couldn't be sad around her. Friends and family remembering the victims of the mass shooting in Boulder, Colorado. He's my best friend. He's a brother to me. Ten lives cut tragically short on Monday. She was a person who all of her life, really, she was about doing service, helping others. Kevin was incredible. He was an incredible father, an incredible spouse, an incredible neighbor. He was just a wonderful, wonderful man who didn't deserve this at all. The suspect, a 21 year old man from nearby Arvada, is now facing 10 counts of murder in the first degree and one count of attempted murder. Authorities promising the grieving community that justice will be served. And now, with the country in the middle of its seventh mass shooting in the past week alone, President Joe Biden has once again called for an assault weapons ban and a wave of new gun control measures. I don't need to wait another minute, let alone an hour, to take common sense steps that will save the lives in the future. And it should not be a partisan issue. This is an American issue. We should also ban assault weapons in the process. In Boulder, Colorado, I'm Camila Bernal. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo reiterating his push to get as many New Yorkers vaccinated against COVID-19. The governor saying that the main focus in the months of April, June and July will be to vaccinate people, saying the vaccines will be crucial in helping the state and the country in controlling the spread of the virus. Vaccines are everything. This is the way we beat this situation. This is the way we turn the page. This is the way we end this chapter. But we have to do it. Governor Cuomo's news briefing today comes as he still faces scrutiny over his handling of COVID-19 related deaths at nursing homes and the sexual harassment allegations against him. A new effort is underway to get the COVID-19 vaccine to New York's growing homeless population. Jessica Easthope reports. Eating, sleeping, and cooking outside in the bitter cold. On days when the wind is whipping, the homeless population takes on another risk during the pandemic. Homelessness is on the brink of, of becoming uh, a pandemic itself. 
According to the latest data from the Department of Homeless Services, more than 53,000 people sleep in New York City shelters every day. Nearly 90% of them are black and Hispanic, communities that have been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. This is the shed that houses our beds. Reverend for Terry Troya, the president of Project Hospitality, advocates for them and for the street homeless who live in encampments like this one. During the pandemic, Project Hospitality was the only church-based shelter network in the city to stay open. This last year, we have seen an unprecedented number of homeless people hunker down in encampments, people that were forced out uh, very early in COVID, uh, some as a result of losing their jobs in COVID. Homeless people across New York City have been eligible for the COVID-19 vaccine for several weeks. So far, the city has administered more than 7,500 vaccines to social and homeless services clients. The city has been using the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The most important thing is to get people vaccinated so they don't get so sick. You need that the one shot, I think, is, is the solution for people who may not make it back a second time. This is now their home. Reverend Troya says the recent explosion of homelessness in New York City can be turned around if everyone does their part, especially during the season of Lent. Almsgiving is giving money or giving your talent or your service to the poor. If our lives revolved around those three pillars every day, not just 40 days, we would be a holier and a more healthy world. The city has been vaccinating people in the shelters where they live and working with its street medicine program to vaccinate people living outdoors. Project Hospitality will make the Johnson & Johnson vaccine available to its residents and shelters starting next week. It's happening slowly but surely. More states are expanding the list of people who can get vaccinated against COVID-19. And as Britt Conway reports, the president says the White House is doing its part to make that happen. State by state by state, more and more people are able to get vaccinated against COVID-19. In some states, expanded eligibility for people 16 years and older started earlier this month. Alaska was first, then Mississippi and West Virginia, and starting today, Utah. Texas, Indiana, and Georgia have just announced plans to do the same. And at least 21 more states will be on board by the start of May. Those states right on track with President Joe Biden's goal. All adult Americans will be eligible to get a vaccine no later than May 1. Though a number of states aren't opening up eligibility until May or later. So why such a wide range of dates? Medical experts say it's because there are state-by-state -state differences in supply and demand something the president addressed Tuesday, saying there are plans to more rapidly acquire enough vaccines to vaccinate every person in the U.S. quicker than they'd hoped. The people leading the charge against COVID-19 see the light at the end of the tunnel. Hope is here. Um, we see increasing supply. Vaccines are the way that we're going to get to the other side of this. But overcoming vaccine hesitancy is crucial at least according to this epidemiologist. Good data and information and good stories can help people change their minds and make the right decisions. I'm Britt Conway reporting. This week marks the one year anniversary of caring for COVID patients at Guthrie. The hospital system has cared for more than 1,200 people since the start of the pandemic. Guthrie is commemorating the work done by doctors and nurses to deliver the best care possible during a very challenging year. Um, we have a great team here. We have a great team in all of Guthrie, and I'm proud of where we have come since this started, and I think we are prepared for whatever is thrown our way. Guthrie is seeing a decline of COVID inpatients in its hospital system and has given more than 45,000 doses of the vaccine to residents. A new study has confirmed the antiviral drug remdesivir shortens the duration of illness in people with COVID-19. The study found that to be true even among non-white patients who have a higher risk of severe disease. The study was published in the journal JAMA Network Open. It doesn't mean that remdesivir is a cure, but the findings do add to evidence that the drug can lighten the burden of coronavirus. In October, remdesivir became the first drug to get full FDA approval for use in treating COVID-19. A New York community is mourning a volunteer firefighter who died in the line of duty. Jared Lloyd's body was found Tuesday evening, almost 24 hours after a fire began at an assisted living facility. The 35-year-old was one of the first responders to the Evergreen Court Home for Adults. Fire officials say he was on the third floor when he sent out a mayday call. 
Lloyd's fellow firefighters rushed to help, but they had to retreat because the walls and roof started to collapse. This was a, a, a tragic, a tragic loss for not only the, the department, um, the, the fire service in general, emergency services, and a county resident. All 112 seniors made it out of the building. One resident later died at the hospital. The cause of the fire is still under investigation. Fencing installed around the U.S. Capitol after the violent security breach in January is being scaled back. Capitol Police tweeted all of the fencing surrounding the outer perimeter of the Capitol has now been taken down. The public will once again gain access to the Capitol grounds, making way for the typical parade of joggers, bicyclists and other visitors in the popular green space. Some streets near the building have also reopened to traffic. Capitol Police also tweeted the inner perimeter fencing remains while the department works with law enforcement and Congress to strengthen security. Still ahead tonight, an Arizona mom with a child fighting for her life is sending a message to other parents. What she wants people to know about the warning signs of a rare COVID-related condition in kids. Here's your local stock market update from Big Fox. Now, your Twin Tiers forecast from Big Fox. This weather forecast is being brought to you by William Matar. Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm meteorologist Monica McNeil. Got a little bit of rain out there today and those temperatures stayed warm. We saw highs today in the low 60s in Elmira and just about around our entire viewing area. Our temperatures were in the upper 50s to low 60s. So these warm temperatures are going to stick around. The rain's not though. We'll see those showers dwindle down to nothing. So tonight, just dealing with some leftover cloud coverage that's out there. Breezy south wind at about 10 to 15 miles per hour and those low temperatures won't drop off very much at all tonight. We will stay in the upper 40s for Elmira over toward Mansfield 53 and up toward Bath 52 degrees. Your story for tomorrow warm. Those southerly winds are going to really help to bump those temperatures up. So we're looking for a very warm surge of air to move into our area as that takes our temperatures into the 70s for your Thursday. So expect a southwest wind at about 5 to 10, partly cloudy out there and warm. Look at our temperature, 72 for Elmira over toward Watkins Glen up to 78 degrees. So folks, we're running about 30 degrees above average for this time of the year. Now the day is going to be nice, but the night is going to change because we have an area of low pressure that's tracking in. That's going to bring in a chance for some showers. So our future radar, we start the clock at six o'clock and we already start to see those clouds returning. Showers are beginning to develop at about 10 p.m. But by Friday morning, that's when we'll see the bulk of those showers pushing in between 4 and 7 o'clock. By 7 a.m., the showers will have drifted off toward the east and we'll be left with a pretty decent day for the second half of your day on Friday. Here's a reason for the change in weather. Again, we've kind of got a back and forth weather pattern. We've got this area of low pressure that's going to be tracking toward the north and east. That is going to bring in the rain for us on Friday morning. So let's take a look at what you can expect over the next couple of days. So we talked about your day on Thursday. Amazing. Lots of sunshine right around 76 degrees. Overnight temperatures will be very mild. 57. Then Friday the showers and it's going to turn breezy. Temperatures will come down and our temperatures will be right around the mid 60s as we head into the weekend. Saturday looks amazing. Lots of sunshine highs in the low 60s, a little bit cooler behind that system. By Sunday, the rain returns. Rain, a little bit breezy with highs in the upper 50s. Again, this kind of back and forth weather pattern will be sticking with us right on through the weekend. All right, you stick with us. We've got more news coming up. 
An Arizona mom with a child fighting for her life is sending a message. She wants parents to know the warning signs of a rare COVID-related condition in kids. Mike Pelton has the story. All she wants is answers, and I can't give that to her, so that's hard. Rihanna Milliman, just a few feet from the hospital, where her eight-year-old daughter Raylan now in the ICU for a week. <laughs> There's, there's times where, you know, I do have to go outside of the room and, and, and cry because it's hard to see your child go through something so, so miserable. Rihanna tells me Raylan diagnosed with MISC, a condition that can affect some kids who've had COVID. It was a very sudden thing. It was on Sunday when she got 105 temperature. And now Raylan dealing with severe gastrointestinal issues. So the doctor said that this is the worst case that they've seen um, of the GI system um, for Miss C because what happened is her bowels have become so inflamed that it's caused a severe infection in her intestines. According to the state health department, there are just 116 confirmed cases of MISC in Arizona. Dr. Anthony Ani, chief medical officer at Banner Children's at Desert in Mesa. Usually fever is uh, one of the commonest um, uh, symptoms, uh, but uh, other symptoms could range from um, uh, gastrointestinal symptoms, uh, mucocutaneous rashes, uh, like uh, a red eye or, or skin rashes. Rihanna says as a nursing student, she had her antenna up when symptoms developed. If you notice something that's off with your child, please, please just take them in if something's not right. And to trust your gut as well as a parent. <laughs> as for Raylan, her difficult journey remains open-ended. Throughout the pandemic, many children have spent more time on devices, whether for virtual learning, social activities, or while their parents are working. But that increased screen time also increases the risk for cyberbullying. Mandy Gaither has the signs to spot in today's Health Minute. From virtual learning to social media, children and teens are surrounded by technology, especially during the pandemic, and it's not always a good thing. There's no escape from cyberbullying because it follows you home because your technology follows you home. Angie Boy with Children's Healthcare of Atlanta's Stephanie V. Blank Center for Safe and Healthy Children says cyberbullying is using any electronic means to intimidate, harass, threaten, or demean a person. Children have higher levels of anxiety, higher levels of depression as a result of dealing with cyberbullying, which can then have an impact on their behaviors as they continue to age. There are cyberbullying signs to spot. Your child may not be using their device as much or don't go to the same apps. They may try to hide the screen when an adult is around or avoid social situations with certain friend groups. Those are red flags that you want to follow up on with your child. Boy says to set technology rules for how long and when they're allowed to be on and the biggest advice she can give. Have open conversations with your child. You want to know where they're going online. Who are they talking to? What apps are they using? Uh, you want to have their usernames and passwords and make sure that you're checking in on them pretty routinely. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. A wedding day, whoopsie daisy. That's what turned an outdoor wedding at Lake Tahoe into an underwater salvage operation. Jeremy Roth has today's Take a Look at This. A waterfront wedding in California nearly turned disastrous when a case of Butterfingers accidentally sent the bride's ring tumbling into Lake Tahoe. Honestly, I thought this this can't be happening. Like, that didn't just happen. Marley and Andrew Kent got on their hands and knees and even considered taking the plunge. But instead, they took to social media, enlisting the help of local outdoor adventurer Phil Abernathy, who dove right in to help. After some searching, Abernathy found the ring tucked between some rocks. When everyone goes nuts, hooray! Tough and tense moments turned into a happy ending for the happy couple. I'm so thankful to have my ring back. It's a great story to like tell our kids one day. Now it's a ring and a story. Yeah. Music soothes the savage beast. 
That's the idea behind pianist Mario Fernando Prado's creative concerts at a Colombian zoo. Prado performs an arrangement of famous classical compositions for the animals. The self-taught musician is no stranger to discriminating tastes. He's arranged over 400 melodies in his career. Kali Zoo officials say Prado's dulcet tones have a soothing effect for a wide array of inhabitants. Primates, birds, lions, zebras, iguanas, and more have enjoyed the shows. The zoo is hoping Prado will pave the way for more artists to animal performances in the future. For Take a Look at This, I'm Jeremy Roth. After a year of being physically apart because of the pandemic, a California couple married for more than 72 years was finally reunited this week. Leah Pizzetti was there for the touching moment. Oh, there he goes. Like he does every day. Oh, oh there you go. There's hey, Roberta. Man. Hey, hi there. Francis Doran has his morning call with his wife of 72 years. I see you got your angel hat on. That's beautiful. I like that one. This is one of their many calls throughout the day, calls they've done for the past year. <laughs> That'd be a long time since we held hands. Francis sits in the Chula Vista home they've owned for 66 years. Roberta is talking from Sharp's Birch Patrick Skilled Nursing Facility, where she's lived for three years. The first two years she was there. I saw her from 6.30 in the morning to 6 at night seven days a week and when they're every day but that stopped when the pandemic started so now this is how they see each other i like this face to face because it, it makes me feel like i'm close to you with the distance time has become more precious as roberta's memories slowly fade away the closer i can be with her the next to her i think the more memory i can bring her out yeah, because she's losing her memory more often because of, I'm not there. Which is why this call is so special. It's their last call before getting to embrace each other for the first time in one year. And one thing I can do tomorrow is I can hold her hand. And I think I, they said I might be able to hug her a little bit. He's been doing his best to talk about her lifelong passions like music. He used to sing to me all the yeah. time. <laughs> but he worries that as their time apart grows, so does the dementia. That hurts quite a bit of a memory, I think. That's why I'm afraid that beginning to... So I'm getting hoping that once I get to see her more often, that we can bring her memory back. So with their final virtual embrace before the reunion. Okay. Here's a big kiss. Okay. Remember, okay. I love you very much, okay? Remember that. He's hoping that this is the last day of her slipping, and tomorrow brings the start of keeping her here. Just about 24 hours later, and the moment has arrived. There you are. Wasting no time. I to see you. Nice to see you, Roberta. They embrace. <laughs> and it's like they never were apart. With physical distance no longer a concern, they sit and talk. To show that uh, how happy I am to see you again, be able to come and visit you at least for a little while. Not as often as I like to, but it's going to work out okay. Cherishing these precious moments together, marking a new chapter in their long book of marriage. Things aren't that bad. There, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. After a hard year, this time together, these simple embraces <laughs> were worth the wait. There's a very, very good day. Yes. Yep. yep. Very good day. We want to leave you with a smile tonight. If you need a good pep talk, turn to this tiny toddler. At just three years old, Adia Latums is a skiing natural. Her father Eric says when he taught his older boys to ski, they would talk themselves through the runs. When it was Adia's time to learn, he said he had to mic her up. Adia peps herself up as she speeds down the Canadian mountains, and when she falls, she gets right back up. She goes fast like the boys, she says. From our whole team, thank you for joining us. We hope you have a great night.